Greetings, sisters and brothers in Christ. Welcome to worship. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So good to be able to worship with you here on this uh, sixth Sunday of Easter. Our original plan was that this weekend would be a graduate weekend and we would be celebrating our graduates here at Our Saviors. We're still celebrating them, but maybe in a little bit of a different way. One of the things I would encourage you to look for is, is uh, uh, there has been a video posted with pictures of uh, several of our graduates, uh, including a couple that I know uh, very well, uh, that's been posted uh, in honor of them and as a word of, of congratulations uh, as uh, they are looking ahead uh, to what the road of life will be leading them on, always uh, seeking the guidance of God. So our prayers are with them and our heartfelt congratulations to all of our graduates. Also, just a word, you know, now we are uh, getting halfway through the month of May, and, and I want you to be aware, particularly in light of the uh, political and legal decisions that have been made here in the state of Wisconsin this week, that uh, we at Our Saviors continue to, to plan to abide in our staying at home uh, practice. We will continue to do worship services like this, uh, recorded and posted online with uh, Facebook Live devotions at uh, 5 o'clock on Saturday and at 8.30 and 10.15 on Sunday mornings, uh, still engaging in this way. Our leaders on our board are, are looking into the different options that are available to us, but know this, whatever we do as a congregation will be in light of our faith, discerning the will of God and grounded in our mission that we are always reflecting God's love through service to the family of God. And so what a blessing it is that we can be one community even as we are apart, even when we cannot be uh, in the same room. The day will come, hopefully very soon, when we will be here again, but not until we are sure that it is safe for especially the most vulnerable in our congregation. And so now I invite you to prepare your hearts to worship the Lord as we remember what it is that allows us to be one community in Christ, the fact that we have been baptized into one body through our baptism into Christ. So let us give uh, thanks for baptism. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert, you promised pools of water for the parch, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent us the Good Shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross, you watered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day, you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the water in this font and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hold together all things in heaven and on earth. In your great mercy, receive the prayers of all your children and give to all the world the spirit of your truth and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus in Athens and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found them, among them, an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that this deity is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. We're going to do something a little bit different for the rest of our time in the Word. We have wonderful passages from the Psalms and from 1 Peter that are available, and I encourage you to, to take a look at the bulletin that is online and and uh, use those in your devotions. But we're going to focus here today on John 14. We looked at John 14, the first verses of that chapter last week, and now we're continuing in that this week. But I want to put the whole thing in context because it all works together. What we are given in this section of John's Gospel is called the, the Farewell Discourse. It is three chapters long, and essentially it is Jesus' farewell address to his followers. 
a farewell address that promises them and every generation to follow, even in our time today, that he will be with us, that he will send a spirit to encourage us, and we will be able to be people of hope as we anticipate the fulfillment of history and the breaking in of the kingdom of God. I think this comes to us even more clearly by going back again from verse 1 in chapter 14 and then into our passage for today. So this is the gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. And Jesus taught, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do not know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me and those who love me will be loved by my Father and I will love them and reveal myself to them. This is good news, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, how delightful it is. You have given us a savior, a master, a teacher, a friend in Jesus, who loves us so much that as he faced his own passion, cared enough to share a message that is based on our own hearts and our own struggles. O oh Lord, you assure us that we do not need to allow our hearts to be troubled. 
that you indeed have prepared a place for us within your home of love, within your existence of eternal life. And you delight us in giving us an invitation that this peace and hope and love may be ours even right now, no matter what it is we face. So, O oh Lord, move us by your Spirit to accept your invitation. Move us so that we may be aware of where it is we live and move and have our being. May we abide in you as you abide in us so we can be fully the people you have created us to be in Jesus Christ. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Like a waterfall of grace, Jesus has given us words of assurance here in the 14th chapter of John. I simply could not proceed in taking a look at the verses assigned for today without going back to that first verse. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. It is the purpose of Christ that his hope, his love would cut through the darkness, would scatter the clouds and the shadows and shine within the hearts of every single one of us. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Because God has given us through Jesus Christ an invitation, live with me, live in me, allow your existence to be colored with the beauty of my existence. Allow your reality to reflect what is my reality, says the Lord, in every single way. He has prepared a place for us and as we face struggles, and as we face trials, he will not leave us orphaned. What a beautiful image Jesus gives to us. I will send you an advocate, it says. In Greek, the word is paraclete. An advocate, which also means an encourager. It, it means a defender. It means a cheerleader. <laughs> I'm not going to leave you alone, Jesus says. I'm ready to cheer you on. I know the skies are gray, but I'm ready to cheer you on. Don't think for a moment I've abandoned you. And do not let your hearts be troubled for one second. Believe in God and believe also in me. Well, we are into, well, into our second month of all of this. And it is getting really old <laughs> and exhausting. And not only is it old and exhausting because of the restrictions that have been placed upon us, it is hard because the stories continue to unfold that the cases of COVID-19 are increasing, that the deaths continue to be steady here in Rock County. Beloit ends up being a, a, a center of where the COVID-19 cases are being centered in this area. This is the news that we have. This is the news we've been given and it is hard to read, hard to listen to, especially now that it's been two months long. And then you throw into the mix the political games that are happening, the Supreme Court decisions, the confusion of whether we have to stay at home anymore or not, the celebrations and pictures that we see out there 
of different communities acting as if prohibition has just been repealed. What is going on? <laughs> it is a very difficult time. And in the midst of it, we are given words of assurance, sisters and brothers. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. There is a reality and a hope that the world isn't paying attention to, that the world doesn't want to have anything to do with, but you know about it. You've been invited into it. The world doesn't see it, but you see it. You've seen it in the works of Christ. You've seen it in the power of God. And you are able to delight in it. That is our good news for all of us. And it's the good news that we are now given the opportunity to share in the midst of this strange and difficult discourse of our life together right now. This is why I think it's, it's just perfect that we were given this lesson from the 17th chapter of Acts today. It's, it's one of my favorite passages and images and events of all the scriptures. It is the great apostle Paul who has spread the good news of Jesus Christ all throughout the Roman Empire. And where does he end up? He ends up in Athens of all places. And Athens with the Acropolis and the Greek gods and Greek philosophers and all that stuff. You, you could go there today and, and it looks very similar in that area to, to, to Paul when he would have gone there 2,000 years ago. And in the midst of all that great Western thought and, and, and great Western ideas, here Paul comes with a completely different message. But he doesn't come in like some, some tornado ready to tear everything down. He, he doesn't come in with this passion and anger telling folks that they are wrong. He comes in wisely and he is fueled by the grace of God and his very first words there in the Areopagus among all the Greek philosophers is this. I see how very religious all of you are. <laughs> Seeing all of the statues and all of the idols that are surrounding him. And he notices that there's one idol to an unknown God. <laughs> and, and, and Paul's going to clear up who this unknown God is. The one true God revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And I can just imagine... Paul entering into the scene, maybe right here in Beloit, maybe up in Madison, maybe in Washington, D.C. Paul entering into the scene, going in the state capitol building among all the politicians. They, they, they get a whole lot more attention than the philosophers today, don't they? And, 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 and hearing how, how, how passionate they are in their positions and, and how they're going to boom stand for what is right and then no one's going to tell them what they're going to do. I can just imagine Paul entering into the scene and saying to them, well, ladies and gentlemen, I see how very passionate you are about your positions. I see how religious you are. For that is the religion now you have made for yourself. And then going step by step by step. Unpacking for them and unpacking for every single one of us that those idols those passions, those expressions of anger and tearing it all down are going to get you nowhere. Doing it a whole lot better than I would be able to do it. I can tell you that. Paul would. And pointing 
to the place where hope can be found. That place is in God. In God as revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Not the Jesus Christ of our religious idols that the politicians love to throw up in the midst of all their passionate speeches. But the Jesus Christ of the word. The Jesus Christ who gives us commandments to guide our life. The Jesus Christ who is the way, the truth, and the life. The Jesus Christ who, who tells us quite plainly, quite bluntly in today's text in John's Gospel that if you love me, you will keep these commandments. And let me tell you, <laughs> I, I can ask everyone, I'm going to look you in the eye, what are, what are the commandments of Jesus? <laughs> where, where do you start? When we talk about the commandments of Jesus, we don't need a year long Bible study to go through the commandments of Jesus in terms of the general message there. We just need one word, don't we? And that word is love. Love is the commandment. Of Jesus. Love is the life of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Love is our song. Love is our way. It is in love we find the truth. It is in love that we find peace. And that's why it is so delightful to be able to engage in, in all of these verses from John 14. Because in Jesus' message to them, Jesus' message to all of us, it just pours out the expression of love and concern for those who are his children, he knows what his children are going to face. He knows what you face. He knows what I face. What we face communion, commun in his one community. He knows what we face and he knows how hard it's going to be. He knows how the allures and the lies of the world are going to seek to derail us. To think we're doing right through our, our, our passionate anger against the other. When in actuality we're simply tearing ourselves and our world down. Love is the way. Love is the truth. Love is the life. And love is where we are going to find hope. If our hearts are not going to be troubled this weekend, if our hearts are not going to be troubled as we continue on into this unknown wilderness that we have been propelled into, if our hearts won't be troubled, it means that we are going to need to be holding on to that love of God. And we can. As Paul puts better than anyone has ever put, he is our home. He abides in us and we abide in him. In him we live and move and have our being. But only when we abide in his truth, practice his love and allow it to swim all over among us and around us, then our hearts aren't troubled. Then we're able to rejoice. Then we are not falling into despair, but we can in love engage even in today's political discourse. That's what's available to us and available to you. So are you ready to, to hold on to the hand of Jesus Christ? To abide in him? To make him your home? to dance the dance of the Trinity and to delight in all that God is able to do. I've been reading various things over these past couple months and 
One of the authors that I've been reading is Thomas Merton, the great, the great mystic. And in his book, Thoughts on Solitude, he describes what's available to us when God is our home. When, when we actually take up residence right now in the place that Christ has prepared for us. And I wanted to, to leave you with these thoughts from Thomas Merton here to end this time together. He writes this. It is a greater thing and a better prayer to live in God who is infinite and to rejoice that God is infinite than to strive always to press God's infinity into the narrow space of our own hearts. As long as I am content to know that God is infinitely greater than I, and that I cannot know God unless God shows himself to me, I will have peace, and God will be near me and in me, and I will rest in him. Ah. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Amen. Confess the ancient faith of the church using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uplifted by the promise of hope and healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Abiding God, you have revealed yourself to us in the form of your Son, Jesus Christ. Embolden your church as your children to reveal your love to everyone in our speaking and in our living, fully abiding in your gracious love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You come near to us when we are lost and you hear our distress. We pray for those who are suffering with COVID-19, those working in the fight against coronavirus, and for those who are hurting in any way, especially those we name to you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You remain with us always, O God, and your kingdom has no end. We remember the saints who have gone before us. Unite us forever in your final victory over death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray in your eternal care, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us pray together the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you, and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
at peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.